It's a really great honor and a pleasure for me to be able to pay my respects to Alan Turing, who has been a hero of mine for, well, ever since I'd heard of him. And uh, the things that he'd done are quite extraordinary. I want to talk about something, one of the somewhat less known uh, contributions of Alan Turing. Um, he's well known for, uh, well, the uh, invention or discovery, whichever we, you like to say it, of the universal Turing machine. And this is a device which is essentially a general purpose computer, but which is idealized so that it never makes mistakes. It can run on indefinitely if it needs to, and it has an, in, an unlimited storage. But apart from that, it is basically what a modern general purpose computer is. And uh, the approximation that we have in modern technology to the ideal of a Turing machine is now extraordinary. And the things that it can do, that general purpose computer can do now, uh, I think would have surprised even Turing. Now, I want to talk about the relationship between the general purpose computer and uh, our minds or our brains. And uh, the issue seems to have been something which Turing was very much interested in uh, right from the start, even before the war when he got very much involved in the work at Bletchley Park deciphering the Nazi codes. And uh, he <coughs> introduced his idea of what we now call the Turing machine in 1936. In fact, there are, I hope this machine works here. This is the problem of modeling the mathematical mind. And uh, I think I've put my glasses on. I won't see what I'm doing. Um, it's a tribute to Alan Turing. And it's inspired by, well, not only his original paper in which he introduced the idea of the uh, Turing machine or the general purpose computer, basically, uh, but also a later paper in 1939, which seems to have been, well, he introduced these two ideas, which I'll say something about in the course of the talk. Uh, these are generalizations of the idea of the Turing machine. And I suppose, now this I'm just speculating here, that the reason that he felt it was in perhaps necessary to generalize the Turing machine was that there are certain reasons to uh, have suspicions about whether uh, the mind is a Turing machine or something which in some sense goes beyond it. So these two ideas, the ordinal logics as they were referred to, and the oracles that he introduced were two ways in which you could extend the idea of a Turing machine or a general purpose computer. They're not ways in which you could uh, realize necessarily as a physical device. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the likelihood, I'm only guessing, but I think it's likely that he did introduce these ideas because he was unhappy about trying to model the mathematical mind by a universal Turing machine. I think, so at that time, and he was trying to go beyond. Now, uh, later, he, he, when he got, realized the power of these computing machines and, and how transistors uh, managed to uh, <clears throat> improve over the uses of valves and things that were used during the war. Um, I think he realized the tremendous power of these machines and maybe he changed his point of view by virtue of that. I don't know why. Uh, I want to introduce the reasons why he might have been doubtful about this, um, but to, I'll come to that shortly. Before doing that, I want to give you a few quotes from Turing. I'm not sure how to work this properly here. Yes. Uh, I, I ha for this particular one, oh, you, I'll stand on the other side, you mean? Uh, well, I have to, I'll do my best. <laughs> I think I'll move all this over here. But I have to stretch in front of it, perhaps. Okay. This was from a 1951 radio talk, and this is the original transcript in the King's archive, and uh, it comes from, um, well, Donald Mickey's machine intelligence. 
So these are various quotes of relevance to this. First of all, if it is accepted that real brains are a sort of machine, and he is now taking the position that, that uh, the way brains act is in accordance with something like a, a general purpose computer or a Turing machine, uh, then it follows that our digital computer suitably programmed will behave like a brain. So that's the idea. The invo argument involves several assumptions which can be quite reasonably challenged. So uh, he was, did realize there were assumptions involved here. It is necessary that the machine be of the sort whose behavior is in principle predictable by calculation. We certainly do not know how any such calculation should be done. And it was even argued by Sir Arthur Eddington, Eddington that um, on account of the indeterministic principle of quantum mechanics, you see, he was considering maybe quantum mechanics made a difference. And that will have some relevance to what I want to say, that no such prediction is the even theoretically possible. So he was worrying about maybe quantum mechanics makes a difference to this. And I want to say something about that later. If we wish to imitate anything so complicated as the human brain, this is a rather interesting comment here, uh, we need a very much larger machine than any of the computers at present. Well, at present, when is that? 1951. At present, uh, any, at present available. We probably need something at least 100 times as large as the Manchester computer. Well, 100 times. I mean, I, have no, I haven't done the calculation here, but it's zillions and zillions of time. The power of pre modern computers is really completely out of the scale of what was able to be achieved by the Manchester computer. It's quite interesting because he, at that time, seemed to think maybe, well, 100 times would be enough, uh, or even an equal size or smaller would be sufficient if sufficient progress were made in the technique of storing information. So he was very optimistic that uh, computers, even of the uh, scale of the Manchester computer of 1951, uh, would be able to achieve equality with human beings. Well, we can see that certainly that hasn't been achieved. And uh, that, uh, well, Turing tests, where you compare computers with human beings, um, so far haven't got terribly far. I gather there was a, uh, a uh, the, one of the most successful ones recently, I just heard. But uh, nevertheless, they still don't, uh, uh, they aren't able to imitate human beings convincingly. Um, another point that's worth making, because there is a notion, well, you come to the quantum mechanics, you see. I think Turing had the idea that there might be random elements uh, that quantum mechanics introduces, and therefore it wouldn't be exactly a Turing machine, it would be something like a Turing machine with a randomizer. But the point he's making here, it's not difficult to design machines whose behavior appears quite random to anyone who does not know the details of their construction. So you can, and it's a standard technique, to produce uh, random numbers, if you like, random outputs, which are at least not strictly speaking random because they're produced by some complicated computational procedure. And if you don't know how they're produced, then they're effectively random. So I think he was more or less saying here that randomness doesn't really make any difference. You can pretty well simulate randomness. OK, so that's the, those are those various quotes. Now I want to talk about what I think is the argument that Turing uh, Really, it made Turing think he might need to go beyond the idea of a universal Turing machine, particularly because of this thing's ordinals. I won't say a great deal about ordinals. I'll mention them briefly at one point. But roughly speaking, it's iterating a certain procedure, which I'm going to indicate in just a moment. That's the ordinals. But the oracles will play a role in what I want to say later on. So why was Turing perhaps? It's Actually, why I'm worried, if you like, whether it's where Turing was worried is another question. But it's a question about the perception of mathematical truth. How do we judge whether a mathematical statement <coughs> is true or false? And uh, I'm going to restrict my attention to what you might consider to be very 
straightforward statements. These are statements about natural numbers. I'm not going to talk about geometry, for instance, where you might worry about what kind of geometry you're talking about. I'm only going to talk about statements which are very, very clear cut. And they're just things about the natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., the non negative whole numbers. Now, the idea, the statement here is that the perception of mathematical truth cannot be reduced to a set of mechanical rules. And this comes from a famous theorem due to Gödel, and Turing was certainly very familiar with this. It featured very much in his 1936 uh, paper, the original one, uh, because he was very much concerned with things that computers couldn't do, if you like. That was part of what he was trying to do. And so as to say what you couldn't do by a mechanical procedure, he had to define what he meant by a mechanical procedure and then show that there were certain things that you can't do with a mechanical procedure. Well, I'm going to phrase Gödel's theorem in a way which it's not normally phrased, but it is a perfectly correct deduction from his, his theorem tells us that for any mathematical theorem, and that, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here with natural numbers and so on, any for any, sorry, it tells us for any set of mechanical theorem-proving rules, and when I say mechanical theorem-proving pro rules, I mean you have a set of procedures which can be checked by a computer. That's the crucial point. You, if you follow these rules and you come to a conclusion that it proves some mathematical statement of the kind we're talking about, then that p alleged proof can be checked by a computer. So uh, that's the kind of rules we're talking about. Then what you can construct is a particular mathematical statement, which Gödel shows you how to do, and I'm calling that G of R, which if we trust the rules, if we believe in the validity of the rules, that is to say, if we believe that anything we derive using the rules must be true, if you trust the rules, then you must also believe that this particular statement, G of R, is true. Yet, it cannot be proved using the rules. Now, that's a very striking, remarkable thing, because it's what, it's, what it's telling us is that whatever these rules are, if they're rules whose consequences we believe in, then that belief or that trust extends beyond the rules themselves. And that's, you have to know that the rules are trustworthy. And that belief that they're trustworthy enables you to extend beyond the rules. So that this particular statement, G of R, cannot be proved using the rules of R, but the way in which it's constructed tells you that must nevertheless believe it's true. See, people usually state Gödel's theorem in a rather negative way. They say well, there are certain things you can't prove. But what they mean is you can't prove using a very specific set of rules. But if you trust those rules, then you can see that statement is true. And this is a very striking thing about the Gödel statement. And it, clearly, Turing was very much aware of this. And that his, when I talked about the ordinals and the ordinal logic systems that he was trying, or the ordinal extension of the, what was called the, uh, well, there were logical systems which depend on these things called ordinals. I'll talk a little bit about ordinals later, but not very much. These things enable you to have a sort of hierarchy of statements. You see, you have your rules R, and then you construct this G of R, and then you, make, you add that to the thing you had before, and then you do that again and again and again and again, and you can get more and more and more powerful methods of proof. That's the idea. And so he was, Turing was studying how far you can go with that kind of thing. I should say that the way I fr phrase this is more or less Turing's version of Gödel's theorem, which in many respects is what's more general and it's easier to prove, too, which is rather interesting. He's stating it in terms of the mechanical aspect of it. It's not phrased in terms of logical systems and formal systems and so on, which we, I'd have to spend the rest of the lecture explaining them. But if you know what a mechanical uh, system is, if you know what a computer is, if you know what a general purpose computer is, that's all we need for this statement. OK, I'll give you an example. Here's an example of the sort of rules you might be talking about. Well, I, I, there's a lot of logical statements you might be involved with too, but the basic piece of mathematics is what's called mathematical induction. Again, I'm just talking about the natural numbers. Suppose you have some statement, P of n, which holds for all, well, 
the question is, does it hold for all these natural numbers, one, two, three, four? And you're trying to prove that it does. Well, that's an infinite number of things you'd have to prove. You'd prove it for one, and then for two, and then for three, and then for four, and then that would take you an infinite length of time. Well, of course, that's no good. So you use this very well-established and very familiar procedure. You establish P of zero. If you can, that's just one thing to establish. So you know it's OK for zero. And then you show that if it's true for n, then it's true for n plus 1. And these two things you establish enable you to say it's true for all numbers. And that's a very usual general procedure for proving things in mathematics. It's things we use in school to prove all sorts of things. So it's well known. It's in technical terms. It's first order piano arithmetic. The question is, are computational rules such as those provided by ordinary mathematical induction sufficient for establishing the perceivable truths of arithmetic, those that we can actually see are true? And Gödel's theorem says no. I'm going to give you an example of something which cannot be proved using mathematical induction. There are lots of such examples. People used to say, well, OK, maybe there are things like that, but they're also incredibly complicated and uninteresting, but who cares? Well, let me give you one. It's, it's, uh, this is a, a nice example. It's due to Kirby in Paris, 1982. Hercules in the Hydra. So here we have Hercules. You have to bear in mind, Hercules is incredibly strong. He can keep on going for as long as you like. He just never gives up, OK? He's also a bit stupid. OK, well, the stupidity doesn't matter, actually, as you'll see in a minute. What he does is he cuts off one of the heads of the hydra. Each time he swings his sword, he cuts a head off. The snag is that each time he cuts a head off, it grows some more heads. And the procedure is like this. I, this is, I've done it kind of schematically here. If he cuts that head off, which is the one he's just about to chop off, what happens? Well, you go back to where it grew out, go down one more, you see what else lies above that just here, and then you repeat what's underneath. OK. So he's grown two more heads. He's cut one off, but it's got two more. Not much good, is it? Next time, he, there's a sort of stalk. You go back to this. You see, that's the origin of it. OK, this time he decides to cut that one off. So you go back to the beginning down here, and it grows two more now, next time. Next time, you cut, he cuts this off, and it goes three more, four more, five more. And you can see the number of heads is growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Well, is he going to win or not? Are the heads going to keep on going, and he'll just be chopping forever? Well, the theorem, the Hercules and Hydra theorem, says that no matter how stupid he is, he always wins. He d doesn't matter whether he's clever. Some Chopping some heads off will win faster than others, but probably it will take much, much longer than the age of the universe, even if he chops off a head a second. And this is an extraordinary thing. Well, OK, it's not so easy to believe, but it's not beyond the, the wit of mathematicians to see that it's true. Uh, the way you prove it is using, and here's where I just mentioned the ordinals, these represent ordinal numbers. Those of you who know what ordinal numbers will know what I'm talking about. But these are, these are ordinal numbers, and each time he chops a head off, it makes a smaller ordinal number. And when the ordinal numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller, they finally have to terminate, and that's when he wins. But it takes an incredible length of time. OK, so that's, the, that's Hercules and the Hydra. Now, what does this theorem tell us? Let me come to lose the theorem because I have to keep going back to it. Here we are. What does it tell us? Well, you see, you might raise various objections to this. Does it tell us that our understanding of mathematics is not encapsulated by rules, in other words, by Turing machine actions? Does that mean that we are necessarily beyond computation? Well, there are various arguments that people raise against this. And the most commonly raised arguments against what I'm calling the Godelian case are the errors argument, the extreme complication argument, and the ignorance of the algorithm argument. The errors argument, which is basically Turing's let out. Eventually, you see, he came around, apparently, to the view 
that maybe we are computational systems, so he needed a let out to this argument. And his let out seems to be that mathematicians make errors. In fact, I can give you a quote. Here's a quote. So let me do that first. This is a lecture to the LMS and London Mathematical Society in 1947. And the quote is this, if a machine is expected to be infallible, it cannot also be intelligent. There are several theorems which say almost exactly that. But the, and that is the sort of theorem I was talking about here. But these theorems say nothing about how much intelligence may be displayed by if, if a machine makes no pretense at infallibility. So somehow it's got to make mistakes to be as good as we are in a certain sense. That's what he's saying. Now, I regard that as pretty implausible. I mean, I hate to say that something Turing seemed to depend on is implausible, but uh, I do, I'm afraid, regard it as rather implausible. The fact that we must make mistakes. OK, we do make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Turing certainly made mistakes. I certainly make mistakes. So that's true. However, the mistakes we make, as far as I can see, are correctable mistakes. If I make a mistake, I may next day say, oops, well, I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe somebody else pointed out, or potentially, at least, I have the ability to see it's a mistake. So I can't see why these mistakes are crucial. So this is, this is the sort of problem I have with the Turing market. I think there are other problems I have with it, but I'll just leave it at this one here. It seems like an implausible, at least to me, let out, because human mathematical errors can be corrected by others, perhaps, or least by the same mathematician. So I'm not very persuaded by the mistakes argument, it seems to me. What about the other ones? Extreme complication argument. Well, it's certainly true that if you want, if we are a computer and we're doing all sorts of complicated things in our heads, we don't know what the algorithm is, even if there is one. Well, no, that's, that's number three, sorry. It is very complicated. So you may say that the algorithms governing human mathematical understanding are so vastly complicated that their Gödel statements are completely beyond reach. Or the Gödel letter, which in fact I think is the strongest of them, which is, you see, it's rather curious, uh, ironic, because Gödel actually believed the argument. I mean, he didn't think we were computers. He thought that somehow the mind was, was Beyond the human, the brain was there too, but the mind was something more than the brain in some sense. So he didn't have a materialist picture of what was going on. There was something external to the material brain going on. So he would be only too happy to have his own argument be foolproof. But uh, the problem is if you don't know what the algorithmic process is, then you can't really apply this argument because it only works when you know, you see, if you don't know what G of R is, if you, know, if you don't know what R is, you see, then you can't make G of R, and you won't know that it's necessarily true. So, you know, so, uh, so there you're stuck. You can get beyond this with various logical arguments, and the way I like to look at it is, is a slightly different way. You say, well, if you're building computers, then in this essence you know how they operate. So this not ignorance doesn't really apply to devices that you construct yourself. So that you can, it's, it has a, a difficulty with that. But I want to present another argument, which it seems to me covers both at least two and three, which makes it seem to me very unlikely that we do act according to a very complicated, unknowable algorithm. Why is that? Well, if it's true, and if this is a reliable, trustworthy, complicated, unknowable algorithm, well, you see, I believe as I hope most scientists do, in natural selection, and that how we came about is the result of natural selection. Well, here I have a cartoon from my book, uh, Shadows of the Mind, and here we have a poor, unfortunate mathematician who's doing a bit of mathematics here, and he is too engrossed in his activities to realize that he's just about to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. Now, you see, of course, this is a cartoon, but it does seem to me that to be a mathematician isn't really much use selectively. I can't really see the selective advantage. I think it's rather a disadvantage to be a mathematician. But um, well, Turing had no descendants. That's, but, uh, it applies to lots of us that we uh, have fewer 
Well, I don't know if that's a good argument or not. But I can't see <laughs> that mathematicians are necessarily selected for, and certainly not selected for things of the kind of sophistication that we see here. Now, this, I should say, is a very low sophisticated... If you're a mathematical logician, this is only the first step after the most elementary kind of mathematical uh, induction about uh, statements about infinity. And it's possible to convince yourself that, in fact, he will. I won't go into it here. But even not knowing what ordinal numbers are, it's not so hard to see that he will eventually win. And that can't possibly be through the experience of our ancestors. These things have only been appreciated, after all, for the last um, 100 or 200 years. So uh, there's not much evolution taking place there, that's certain. So I can't see how this very sophisticated, very precise, unknown, unknowable algorithm can have come about through natural selection. So I leave you with that challenge. And it seems to me it's a big challenge. So what's been going on then? What was selected for if it was not a complicated, unknowable algorithm for doing things, arith arithmetical problems, which I can't believe? What it was, I think, is consciousness. You see, I would argue that consciousness, well, you see, it has many manifestations. Passive things, qualia, perception of the color red, or appreciation of a melody, or so forth, or active free will, all these things. All sorts of words here which have to do with consciousness in one way or another, pain, love, red, pride, determination, um, intelligence, disgust, etc., etc. I want to concentrate on one word, that's understanding. And also only understanding in a very specific context. Namely the one which you use to derive the, the validity of G of R and the fact that it can't be derived from R. In fact, I'm going to give you this argument later on, so wait for it. And that's the hardest part of what I'm going to say, but I'll, I'll give you the argument. So it's not something which is that difficult. I mean, I'll give it an outline. And it, the basic point is understanding of what you're doing. And you can't, it seems to me, formalize understanding in terms of a purely computational system. And here is issue, I say, is a computer, a computer control robot capable of genuine understanding? Well, this other question has come up here. And whether you could test for understanding is one question. Um, <clears throat> and that relates to the Turing test. Say, can you see whether, can you ask your computer or person, whichever it is, uh, a question which requires understanding in the response? And that's the sort of thing that computers tend to lack. In fact, you see, I would say that how do we use computers in most things if you want to solve some or simulate some problem about how stars behave or something and you have a calculation you want to perform to see what it's going to do? Well, you supply the understanding, the computer does the calculation. It's a symbiotic relation we have with computers. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But it does seem to me, okay, the answer that the computer produces, it hasn't the remotest idea what it is, what it's for. You have to supply the understanding. So it seems to me the understanding is what the computer doesn't have. Um, and now I've had three words here. I can't, I'm not going to define understanding. I don't know how to define understanding. The three other words I don't know how to define either. Intelligence is one of them, and awareness is another. All I'm saying is that they seem to depend at least intelligence, whatever it is, I would think depends on understanding. Because I wouldn't like to say of an entity that it is intelligent if it doesn't possess understanding. That certainly a, seems to me a natural use of words. Likewise, I would hesitate to say that an entity possesses understanding if it does not possess awareness. So it is related to this consciousness issue. Awareness is an aspect of consciousness. So it seems to me so is understanding. This doesn't say that computers couldn't have it. It's just saying that they're interrelated in this kind of way. So if understanding can be shown to be beyond computation, and that's the sort of argument I've just been trying to present you with, then intelligence is not a matter of computation. Moreover, certain aspects of awareness, and perhaps all, are beyond computation also. So that's the, my position here, is that, is that these things are beyond computation. Now I want to get slightly more technical, and I hope you'll bear with me here. Uh, 
because I want to give a proof of that statement I was giving you before, the one just here. And to do that, I just want to introduce a, a few notions. First of all, just there's a thing called a pi one sentence. That's actually one of the simplest types of mathematical statements you can make, which can be extremely difficult to prove. And one of the most famous is the famous Fermat's last theorem that was proved by Andrew Wiles a few years ago. Uh, the famous Goldbach conjecture, actually Fermat's last theorem, well, you probably heard it. The Goldbach conjecture is that every even number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers. It's still unproved. And there's the Lagrange theorem that every natural number is the sum of four square natural numbers. Well, Lagrange proved that. That is a theorem. But these are all examples of what are called pi one sentences. And they can all be phrased in the following form. You can say, there is a computation, that is to say, a Turing machine action, which if it goes on forever, that's saying this pi one sentence is true. If it stops at some stage, that's to say it's false. So you set it looking for, let's take the Goldbach one. You said set it looking for even numbers which are not the sum of two primes. Well, two is ruled out. Four, okay, two plus two, six, three plus three, eight, three plus five, and it keeps on going. Does that computation ever come to an end? It's come one which is not the sum of two primes. If it comes to an end, then that pi one sentence is false. If it goes on forever, it's true. So many, many number theoretic things can be stated in the non-termination of a Turing machine action. Now, this is a, you can generalize this. This is really for the logicians in the audience. You can generalize this to things called pi n sentences, where a pi 2 sentence is uh, something says there doesn't exist an x such that a pi 1 sentence, depending on x, is true. These are statements which depend in a computable way on a certain number of numbers. It might as well just be one number, the way I'm going to talk about it. But we have to think about statements which may depend on, on numbers. An example would be, say, let's think the, the, uh, the Lagrange one. Lagrange theorem says that every number is the sum of four square numbers. Well, that's a statement about four, if you like. Four square numbers. Every num number is the square of sum of three square numbers? No, it isn't. Seven isn't, you see. Not two either, but more than four, five square numbers? Yes, it's true. So this is a statement which depends on the number, the number of squares you're adding together. I just want to show you, you could put these things in the form which depend on a natural number. That's all this is about. You need that. OK. Pi two sentences. I can give you an example. There's a well-known one, still unproved, that you have a prime number and another prime number which differs from it by two. For example, 13 and 11. Are there an infinite number of them or not? That's a pi two sentence. They can be, that one's unproved. There are many things which are uh, difficult to prove, which are pi two sentences. There's a very famous one which is not difficult to prove. It was proved by Euclid, which is that there are infinitely many prime numbers. That means for every prime number, you can find the bigger prime number. That's uh, basically a pi two sentence. Got that right? OK. Now, I'm going to talk about Turing's oracle machines now. In fact, I'm going to generalize it in a way. But first of all, let me tell you what an oracle machine is. This is, as I was saying, the 1939 paper involves these two notions. You see, if you have a, a Turing machine, it, you might have some subroutines. You go and consult something, and it comes back and tells you the answer, and then you go on with that. Now. An oracle machine has, as one of the commands, you can say, OK, go and consult the oracle. And you come up, the machine goes, confronts the oracle with a certain pi 1 sentence or a pi n sentence. It says, is, it might say, is Goldbach conjecture true or not? You see, if it asks that, then the oracle is supposed to say yes or no, whichever way around it is. So it's a sort of additional thing. We have no idea how to make an oracle machine, but the idea is, Theoretically, you could consider this generalization 
of a Turing machine where you put in this command where it goes and consults the oracle. And these could be pi n. Uh, uh, there could be statements of the kind I've just been talking about. Now, I'm not going to, I'm going to generalize Turing's idea. You see, that's fine. You can think of these things theoretically, but it's not really very much like what we do. You see, you can't go and ask anybody, any, you know, an oracle is go by conjecture true. That was, well, you could ask it, but it's, we wouldn't know how to make it produce the right answer. So I'm going to introduce another notion, which I'm calling a cautious oracle. Now, a cautious oracle is supposed to be modeled much more on what a human being might be like, or a really good mathematician, let's say. And it's allowed to do, I've, I've got this funny notation here, you see. Uh, the cautious, the, this thing, we call that pomega. It's, it's really a pi, uh, but it looks like an omega with a twiddle on it. And so, in many British universities, it's called pomega. I'm going to call it pomega here, too. So this pomega thing is the oracle, and if it acts on the statement you give it, it could say, yep, that's true. That's what that means. Or it said, nope, nope, that's not true. Or it could say, I'm sorry, I, I really can't answer that question. I don't know, I don't know. It's allowed to do that too. If you ask it, go back trajectory, it might well say, I don't know. Or it might say, don't bother me now, I'm still thinking about it. Ask me again tomorrow. Okay, and then you ask it again tomorrow, and it might still say, no, 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 I'm still thinking. Don't ask me now. i come back another time. So that's all right. These are the three kinds of responses. It could say true, false, I don't know, and I'm not going to be able to answer that question. Or it says, sorry, I'm not ready yet. This isn't actually a response, because you have to keep on asking it. It might go on forever. Or it might ultimately say, well, yeah, I've tried hard enough. I'm just not going to answer that. Or it might come up with an answer. So that's my cautious oracle. It's a much more human version of an oracle. You see, it's something you could imagine a, a really good human mathematician might be like that kind of cautious oracle. Okay? Now, and this, this notation I'm using, true, false, dunno, uh, I'm still thinking. Okay? And then we, a poeming a device. I'm calling this a device rather than a computer because you know, to me, a computer means a Turing machine. It's something which acts in accordance with Turing's rules. So I'd rather use a different word. That's just a word. So I'm calling it a Pomega device, and that's an example of it. So it's like a Turing machine. The D thing here refers to the Turing machine action, but the Pomega is the oracle that you kind of feed into it. Okay? It means consult the, uh, uh, the, the Pomega, the oracle. Um, now, the thing is, there's one thing about these machines, or, or these devices, is that if you had this Pomega thing, in principle, you could work out what it's going to do, or at least you could if you had a proper Turing machine. You just have to add that to it. But the thing is, in, in detail, it involves massive current, co concurrent activities. Because, you see, you consult it with your with your pious sentence, and it says, it may say, sorry, I don't know. Or it may say, look, I'm still thinking about it. Ask me tomorrow or next time you come round. <laughs> and in which case, you have no response. So what you've got to do is go on with your calculation and do it twice. Once if it was true, and again if it was false. And keep those going at once. And then you might in the process have to ask it again, and then you've got to keep all those going at once. So that in order to work out the operation of this device, there's a huge parallel operation going on at the same time. Nevertheless, it's still completely computational apart from the pomega. Okay? Now here is a crucial thing that Gödel introduced, what's called Gödel numbering. And it's really, if you like, I suppose the origin of Turing's idea of stored program computers, which was the crucial thing that your instructions go into the machine too. And Gödel showed how you can transform statements into numbers. Well, Gödel actually had a pretty complicated way of doing it, which depended on, on uh, prime factorization or something. It's much easier, I should say what doing is here. You see, you can list either the pi one sentences 
or the pi 1 sentences depend on some arbitrary number, or the pi n sentences, or the Turing machine actions, or the Turing Permiga machine actions, where this is your cautious oracle. You don't know what Permiga is, and you don't know how it, but, but you just have a slot for it in your listing. So the idea is that Gödel shows how, in a completely computable way, you can assign a number to each one of these things. And that's all you need to know. But it's the idea of doing that has tremendous consequences. So the listing assigns in a computable way a natural number to each member of whichever of these different classes it is. And Gödel's original method, as I said, was complicated. And you can have simpler ones. OK, now we're armed. I'm going to show you the proof of this. So be prepared. The proof of that, which I'm pretty well going to give you, It's this Gödel-Turing theorem, if you like, Turing's version of the Gödel theorem. And I'm only going to apply it to computations. Um, that is to say, we're going to see which of these pi-1 sentences uh, is, is, uh, is true or not. And how do we decide the truth of that? Is that through some computation or not? Well, let's suppose it is. Suppose that we have a computation. This r is basically the r I was talking about before. It's this r, OK? Suppose we had some procedure r which applies itself to two numbers. If it comes out with true, what's that telling us? That tells us that this particular computation c, see, in the girdle listing, this is the cth one. So this c stands for which computation we're looking at. And the x stands for the computation. You see, I'm talking about computations which depend on a number. So we do that. So it tells you this computation, that's the cth one, depending on the number x. If r tells you it's true, then it comes to a conclusion true. Then this says this computation goes on forever so that the pi 1 sentence is true, OK? I'm going to rattle through this a bit. You have to really think about it if you want to be convinced that it's true. But don't worry about being convinced. You can just, well, you can if you're careful about it. First step is something rather trivial. I'm going to modify r to something I'm calling e, such that it still satisfies the same statement as above, but where it never actually says false. If it were to have said false, I just put it into a loop. So it just goes on forever. So it either says true or it goes on forever. But apart from that, it just satisfies the same thing as before. OK? So that's a fairly trivial modification. Now what are we going to do? I'm going to put x equal to c. OK, this is true for any x. So I can put c in there. And the statement we had above is now this one, e of c, c is true implies that this computation never stops. But this computation e of xx, notice, is now a computation depending on a single parameter. And this girdle listing was computations in terms of a single parameter. So it must be one of these. OK, which one is it? Well, let's call it h. And that is the, capital, the script h I've got here. So this thing, e of cc, is h of c where this one is the little h -th of the c's, OK? And now you just look at this. You say, taking c to be given by the particular value of c, which is h, and then you look at the statement here. You see, well, now c is equal to h. The curly c is equal to h. So we take, this is exactly this here. So that e h of t, h h of t, so e of h of h, says true, that implies h of h doesn't stop. But you notice from the thing above, this is the same as h of h. So this says that if h of h produces, stops and produces the result t, that means this h of h goes on forever. Therefore, it must go on forever, because it's the same as h of h. So this tells us that this goes on forever. But if it goes on forever, that means that e can't access. We know it's true, because we've trusted everything up to this point. 
It's, 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 it's the argument that I was giving you before, that if we believe in the validity of the procedure, then you have to believe in the result. And the result is that this particular computation doesn't go, ever stop, but this E doesn't tell you that because it is the same as H, and so it never stops either. That's the argument. Okay, you've got to think about it for, you know, about three days or something. But, <laughs> but now, what I'm going to do, you see, I, I it seemed to me you could generalize this argument. I hadn't had the idea of the cautious oracle, but I had to write an article for, for Barry Cooper's volume, and so I have to do something new, you see, so I thought, well, I had a vague feeling I could do something with oracles. But uh, it took me ages to see. All you need to do is take off that transparency and put this one on. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the argument. This is now a oracle machine. The argument's exactly the same. If you follow the last argument, you follow this one. It's exactly the same argument. And so it tells you that this particular oracle machine action cannot be ascertained by this R. OK, well, look, that's the idea. I won't go into the details anymore. But it tells you that it's not just oracles of the form, you know, this pi 1 sentence doesn't, uh, you can't solve the problem with the pi 1 sentences. It's not just that. It's, it's a more general thing. One reason for saying this is that there are people who think, well, you could have generalizations of the notion of computation called hypercomputation. And those are more or less things that an oracle machine could do. But what I'm showing you is that hypercomputation isn't good enough either, because our understandings, by the argument I've just given you, extend beyond even those oracle machines, even the cautious oracle machines. So it's got to be something more than that. OK, well, it seems to me what it is is consciousness and Consciousness, I claim, is something non-computational. Well, you see here I'm saying, what does it show? It shows us that some aspects of understanding are beyond computation. Mathematical understanding, well, is it just mathematical understanding? I don't think so. The argument with the saber-toothed tiger really shows it's not that. It's more general kinds of understanding that we're selected in favor of. Human understanding generally, well, Human consciousness, I think this is understanding isn't quite, it's only one aspect of consciousness. I would say it's consciousness. Animal consciousness, I wouldn't draw the line here either. It seems to me animal conscious, animals are sufficiently like us that I think they're conscious and that they're, what they do isn't that different from us. Okay, they don't do sophisticated mathematics, I think. But uh, maybe dolphins do, but who knows. Um, so I would consider that, uh, that it's consciousness is the issue. Not perhaps life. I think maybe some life isn't conscious. I'm always worried about insects. Once I saw, saw a film of an insect devouring another one like this, then the movie panned back, and you can see all the time that insect was being devoured by a third insect. And I thought, well, look, that's not a very conscious thing to do. <laughs> so, OK. OK, well, now you see, I happen to believe that whatever we do with our brains is, is not different in principle from whatever goes the laws that govern the rest of the world. But we don't altogether know what those laws are. Well, you see, might it be beyond computation? Could it be classical particle physics, classical field physics, quantum physics, or beyond quantum physics? Now, there are all sorts of issues that come up here, particularly in relation to the fact that modern physics depends, or not just modern physics, going back to Newton and Galileo and the Greeks, depend on continuous parameters and not the discrete numbers that computers act on with. OK, I'm going to say that I don't think that's the real point. And Turing himself argued that, well, you can approximate continuous numbers well enough by finite decimals and things like that. I'm not totally convinced by that argument, but nevertheless, I would agree with Turing that that is probably not the, the point, that I don't think that's the point. What about quantum physics? Well, you see, quantum physics depends on uh, continuous parameters, just, and not just that. It depends on discrete. What's the time? I should, I should get some idea of how far I should. I got a, I've got a few minutes. <laughs> quantum physics or beyond quantum physics? 
I'm going to try and make the case that it's something beyond our present day quantum mechanics. Before doing that, I just want to give you a very quick uh, point. You see, people often think that laws of physics have to be computable. They tend to argue that, well, you know, of course, that's what we mean by law of physics. I'm just going to say, no, I don't think so. I'll do this very quickly. Um, you could make toy model universes which are definitely not computable, even though they're completely deterministic. And one way of doing that is to depend on tiling properties of, of what are called po polyominoes, those are squares glued together. And if they tile the plane or don't, the, if it does one thing, the universe does one thing. If it does the other, they does the, do the other thing. And the, this happens to be one of these non-computable uh, problems. You see, it's, does it tile the plane? These are examples which do. Here's another example which does, but the fact that it's a difficult problem, you can see from that example, because it's pretty difficult to see how that tiles the plane, even though it does actually extend to infinity. But let me not waste time on that here, because I think there are other things I want to say. I just want to show that there are perfectly, well, not physically plausible, but mathematically plausible models of toy universes which are not computable, which you cannot simulate on a computer. So it's certainly a genuine question, that's all I'm saying. That, that it could be non possible to, not possible to simulate. But I do want to talk about quantum mechanics, because as we saw, Turing himself already thought quantum mechanics might ha have relevance. So I have to tell you something about quantum mechanics in the remaining minutes that I have, which is not really enough time, but let me at least have a go at it. Here I have two idealized experiments which illustrate the conflict, the basic conflict in quantum mechanics between particle-like behavior and wave-like behavior. So here we have a laser, say, which is a source of photons. Now, here we have what's called a beam splitter or a half-silvered mirror, and half the light goes through it to this detector over here, other half of it goes reflected to that detector. Now, for a single photon, what you find is for an idealized experiment, is that either it goes this way or this way. It's an exclusive, if this it registers, this won't. If this doesn't register, this does, and vice versa on the other, on the one. So it's a, an exclusive or, this or this, but not both, not neither. That's a very particle-like behavior. But you can slightly modify this by putting two proper mirrors here, having now another beam splitter there, have all these path lengths equal, detectors here and here. And then, miraculously, you find every time the photon comes along, it goes this way and never that way. If these were particles like what we were trying to do here, then it might go this way, it might go this way. If it goes this way, it might go this way, this way. If it goes this way, it might go this way, this way. So it's equally likely to come here or here. But you don't find that. You find that the possibilities of coming here in some mysterious way cancel each other out. And so now this is more like a wave-like behavior. This is particle-like, that's wave-like. And the way we make sense of that is introducing the formalism of quantum mechanics. I'm not going to tell you too much about it. The crucial point is that you have these things called states and that alternatives occur in superposition, so they can happen at once. So let's go back to this case here. That means that the photon might do this, or it might do this. And you have to understand that, in a sense, it actually does both at once. Otherwise, you couldn't get the interference which stops it going this way. So the photon feels out, at least, both routes. It goes both ways at once. So alternative A is one of them, alternative B is the other. And you have to consider that they both happen at once. It's even more mysterious because we have waiting functions, waiting factors here. You might think these were probabilities. They're not. These are complex numbers. Here I've got the complex plane. Complex means involves the square root of minus 1. You can plot those numbers on a plane. And these numbers w and z are two different numbers in this complex plane. The Schrodinger equation, which I'm using the letter u for, that means unitary evolution, tells you that as you evolve a state, a quantum state, these alternatives each one evolves as though the other one wasn't there. And these numbers here, these weighting factors, are constants. So you have two constant numbers here and two things sort of going on their own way, own merry way, irrespective of the other. And that's what's called linearity of quantum mechanics. These things kind of add together, and that addition is preserved throughout time. 
But if you make a measurement, you do something completely different, and you suddenly say that the state jumps to one alternative or the other, and the probabilities are now given by these squared moduli. That means the square of the distance of the points in this plane from the origin. So there are two quite different processes in quantum mechanics. One is what the state does when it's not being measured. The other is what it does when it is being measured, which is a bit funny. And there's a thing that I would refer to as the merit. Well, it's called the measurement problem. I think that's underrating it. It's the measurement paradox. Because why isn't your measuring device also a quantum system? It's made up of the same sorts of particles as everything else. So why does the thing know it's being measured anyway? Why doesn't it just do this all the time? But these are in conflict with each other. So the U and the R process are basically in contradiction with each other, even though they are two key ingredients of quantum mechanics. You need them both. Now, what are the implications of this? Well, I'll give you one. Linearity, what does that mean? Here I have a laser again. The photon can go this way. It's a brown thing, and it does all that. Another thing it might do is we might put a mirror in the way, and it goes the other way. It's the green thing and does all that. But if that's a beam splitter, what's it going to do? Well, if that's a beam splitter, it does both at once. And so you have this thing and that happening in superposition. Well, you might not worry too much about that, but let's suppose <laughs> we do something else. This is a cat. This is Schrodinger's cat, of course. And I've been kind to it this time because I've got a mirror in here, and so the photon doesn't hit the detector and the cat survives. But of course, you can see what I'm going to do, because if I hadn't got that mirror there, then it goes through and kills the poor cat. But what do we do if we put a beam splitter? Well, according to Schrodinger equation, the cat is in a superposition of being alive and dead. And of course, Schrodinger, in introducing his cat, of course, it wasn't a real experiment, because he wouldn't do a thing like that. But it was a thought cat. But nevertheless, according to his own equation, the poor thing would be in this limbo state of alive and dead at the same time. And he was more or less saying, well, look, that's ridiculous. Don't believe my equation. He didn't say it quite as bluntly as that, but that's more or less what he was saying. Well, let's do something else. Some people say, well, it's the observer has to come along and see the cat. I can't quite see why the cat's consciousness couldn't settle the issue already. But observer comes along and looks at the cat. And here we've got an unhappy observer imagining. This is the observer's mentality, if you like to have that too. And you see that from the expression on the observer's face, if you don't want to think this is part of physics. OK? Of course, the other thing that might happen is that the cat is alive and happy. And we have a happy expression on the man's face. But then, of course, according to the evolution with the beam splitter, you, everything is all superposed. These little dots are the environment, because sometimes people say, well, it's the environment which does it. And I can't see why the environment makes any difference, because it's still there in superposition, even uh, well, in this case here. So there's a problem. Now, I won't go into the 15,000 different alternative viewpoints there are for trying to get around this difficulty. All I'm going to do is to give you my viewpoint. And my viewpoint is that quantum mechanics is not quite right. And I'm going to introduce Schrodinger's lump. OK? It's the same thing as the cat, but it's a more humane version, because <laughs> it's only if it goes one way, it moves the lump. If it goes the other way, the lump stays in its original position. And going into various reasonings, which I won't give you, which depend on comparing general relativity with quantum mechanics and so on, I come to the conclusion, as a Hungarian physicist, Dioshi, had come to before I had, several years before, that this superposition is an unstable one and that it only has a finite lifetime. And that lifetime can be calculated in the following way. Thank you. In the following way, we work out, well, let me say it in one way. If this is just an ordinary displacement, I imagine that there were two lumps on top of each other, and I pull one away from the other, 
and the only force I consider is the force of gravity. How much energy would it cost me working against gravity, pulling those two lumps apart? Of course, in the actual experiment, there's only one lump in superposition, but this is just a way of working out what EG is, or another way of saying it's the gravitational self-energy of the difference. Well, don't worry too much about that. But this thing, the reciprocal of it, is a measure of the time, time scale of the life of that superposition. So I would say that according to this proposal, and there are experiments which are being performed to try to see if this proposal is right or not, I should mention also a point about this, is that when we remove move the lumps away from each other, you might have to worry about their material composition. And there are issues to do with that, so you have to see what what they would have been if they were stationary. Let me not go into the details of that, but there are detailed calculations you can work out to see what that lifetime should be. And there is a proposed experiment. Oh, they started doing this about 10 years ago, and uh, it's been, the main person involved is Dick Baumeister, who is involved, uh, he's both at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and at Santa Barbara in the United States. And the idea is to take this cube thing, which is about, a tenth of the thickness of a human hair in size. You just couldn't see it, it's just too small to see. With a good lens, you could probably see it. And by taking your photons and flipping it both ways and this way and that way, you put it into a superposition of two different locations which differ from each other by about the diameter of an atomic nucleus. And you try and hold it in that superposition for a matter of seconds or minutes, probably a minute or so. And then, see, in this experiment, the photon goes here, it's beam split to these two alternatives. Here, this one's a cavity. It's been kept, this part of the photon's wave function. This one's another cavity where the photon bounces backwards and forwards about a million times, hitting this thing and moving it. So if it comes this way, it moves it. If it goes this way, it doesn't move it. So it's in a superposition of two locations at once. That's the nuclei, if you like. And the... Uh, after that period of time, you bring it back and see whether you have coherence or whether the photon has lost coherence. Okay, that experiment is still being done. Last time I talked to Baumeister, which was about a year ago, he said very uncharacteristically, in 10 years, we'll have your answer. <laughs> That's nine years now, so I'm waiting. Okay, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because the way we do quantum mechanics, if you just think it's the Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation, or the evolution which I was describing, um, the U evolution, is a deterministic equation, and it's a computable equation. You can put it on a computer. So it can't be that. If it's just the working out the probabilities of the measurement thing, that's basically computable too. But there's a gap because those two things are inconsistent. So in my belief, as I've just been trying to say here with the Schrodinger's lump, is that there is an extension of quantum mechanics needed, and it's this extension which we're going to have to appeal to to see where the non-computable physics lies. Now you might say that's a pretty far-fetched thing, maybe. It's the Sherlock Holmes arguments, you see. You say, um, once you've eliminated all the possible things that could no, when, once you've eliminated the impossible, then whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So I'm using that weak argument, Sherlock Holmes' argument. You see, even more, you might say this is even weaker, because I'm going to say that it's of great relevance in the brain. Now, you see, normally when we think about the brain, we think about neurons and signals going along the neurons. And these signals disturb too much of the environment. There's no way the new physics, if it could be discovered, has any relevant directly to the transmission of nerve signals. There's too much disturbance of the environment. However, in the strengths of synapses, there is a very good chance that there could be a role to play for these things called microtubules. I learned about these things in my ignorance from Stuart Hameroff. Uh, when I wrote my book, The Emperor's New Mind, I hoped that it might inspire young people to do physics or something like that. Well, I hardly ever heard any young person saying they were inspired by my book. I got lots of letters from old retired people who were the only ones who seemed to have the time to read my book. But occasionally, 
I'll be with you in a minute. Occasionally, uh, there was a scientist from some other field who had read my book, and Stuart Hameroff was one of them, and he told me that microtubules, in his view, were essential to an anesthesia. In fact, that's what he does. He puts people to sleep. He's an anesthesiologist in the United States, and uh, he also theorizes, rather than just putting people to sleep, he wonders what he's doing as well. Uh, and his theory is that it is to do with microtubules. I think his case is I, it's the first time I've seen anything with any plausibility about it. If you talk to most physicists, they'd say, well, that's ridiculous. These things, you've got diameters in terms of nanometers and so on. Each of these proteins, they're called tubulins, are four by four by eight nanometers. Physicists would say, well, body temperature this has got to be. You're, you're looking for something like superconductivity or something at body temperature. That's ridiculous. Too much environmental de decoherence. I'm just going to throw something at you at the end here. These are recent experiments, very remarkable ones, done by this fellow and his colleagues, Anirban Bandiyapadhyay. It's hard to pronounce his name, but it's more or less that. He works in Japan. He's an Indian. And he does experiments like this by putting um, currents and measures resistance and so on. And he finds rather extraordinary features, all sorts of different frequencies that you have which occur and look like things which cannot be explained by classical understanding. I think I, he finds a thing called ballistic conductance. Suddenly they become very conductive when you have the right frequencies. It looks like a very quantum mechanical thing. Moreover, it's something that you have which seems to be independent of the temperature. So that these, well, he finds quantum effects, characteristic quantum effects, and some new kind of condensate which takes place. I won't go into this for the two reasons that I don't have enough time and the other that I don't really understand it. But it does seem that, they, it does seem that there is reasonable evidence that you do have coherent quantum activity in the microtubules. And the next step would be to see if this quantum activity can act in a more global way in microtubules across the brain. And I myself would consider it really quite probable that something like that is happening and that this new physics is being probed by this. Well, it's obviously a huge area to be studied by all sorts of people, and it suggests at least a possibility that there might well be something going on in the brain which goes beyond present-day physics, which depends on something outside the quantum physics we have today, which depends, however, on quantum mechanics lower than the one where the sufficient number of microtubules acts in concert, but that conscious actions on this scheme would be the product of such uh, beyond quantum mechanical activity. Thank you very much. When Gödel proved the incomplete theorem, he does make a reference to this elusive truth. But within six months, he actually figured out that he can have stated much more simply which is G of R is not provable from R, but if you add the axiom that R is consistent, then this proves G of R. So now it's all about probability. You all have simply the, the, you need one more axiom which states that the, the system R is consistent, and then things follow, then, then G of R is provable for, with one more axiom. No, no. And now it makes no reference to truth. <laughs> No, you need a continuing set of axioms. Of course, you could add one no, more. No, you can do it. It's to true. go beyond the, the first order piano arithmetic, of course. Yes, I agree with that. No, this and you could, that would do the Hercules and the, and the Hydra. But then you have another girdleization. It's all, each, time, each time you add one more consistency axiom. Yes, but it's not a computational system. See, that's the trouble. It's a perfectly computational system. It's just one more axiom. No, 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 no. I, I think we have to talk about this later. Now, if it's, you see, I haven't said anything about how many axioms or which axioms. I'm just saying that they're computationally checkable. That's all you're using. If they're computationally checkable, you can have a procedure for, I, I mean, that's Turing's uh, ordinal logic procedure. That's exactly what he was doing. He was saying, add, add your Gödel statement, and then you have a new one. Add the new Gödel statement, then you have a new one. And then you go on, and then you go up to, omega up to infinity, and then you have to formalize all that, and you add a new one which encompasses all that. 
and then you go on to all through the ordinal number, the computable, computable ordinal numbers, and then you start running into problems about how you systematize that in a general way. So this is, it doesn't get you out of it, you see, because how, as soon as you've got a, a syst computationally checkable system, it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't have to be first order of piano arithmetic or anything like that, whatever it is, this argument will apply. So, one more axiom won't do it, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so as far as I can see from your talk, um, understanding intelligence and consciousness give us certain abilities as humans that machines can't do. So I was wondering if there's a test that um, humans should be able to pass, but the machines shouldn't be able to pass if they're based on sort of classic Turing machines. I'm having an awful lot of trouble here. All right, this, sorry. This is um, echo, I think. Which so as far is... as I can see, um, according to your theory, um, by being conscious, by being capable of understanding and being an intelligent person, yes. I can do certain things. I can gain certain kinds of insights. Or I, I don't fully understand the details of that. But yeah. what, I'd like, what I'd like to know is there's some kind of test that you could propose um, that a classic Turing machine shouldn't be able to solve, um, that a human being with these properties of consciousness or whatever should be able, always be able to pass that we could use to prove your theory would be true or not? The trouble is that any specific question, you see, if you say, is theorem X provable by a human being and not by a computer, I'm afraid that'll never work because you can always design a computer and you put in it, say, if somebody says, is theorem X true, and I tell you it is true, you're supposed to say yes. Well, that's a perfectly computational action. If it's one statement, you see, is always doable by some computer. So you have to have a family of statements. And then the question is, is that family, uh, are the answers um, recursively enumerable or recursive, whatever it happens to be? So, and those are the things, you see, it has to be an infinite set of problems. And you can't ask anybody, even a computer, an infinite set of problems. So you, it, you can't quite do it in that way. I'm not quite sure which way I'm looking because I can't see anything either. It's, it's, the, it's the lights. Um, I think you have to just rely on understanding. You see, can you, I think it is a Turing test thing. Can you test whether the computer actually has genuine understanding? And that, after all, is what the Turing tests are about normally. So I don't think it's anything profoundly different from that. And it's certainly not individual specific statements, because any statement whatsoever, any one statement, OK, there's two Turing machines. One says, give me that statement, and I say yes. And the other one says, give me that statement, and I say no. And whichever way around it is, one of those Turing machines has given you the right answer. So it's certainly not something that, for one statement, you could say was beyond the capabilities of the computer. It just wouldn't know what it was doing. It doesn't have the understanding underlying why it says yes or why it says no. Thank you very much. Uh, this uh, this uh, lecture is online, and we have a question from Liverpool for Sir Roger. If a large-scale quantum computer is ever successfully designed, what implications would this have for the modeling of human intelligence, consciousness, etc., <laughs> if any? Well, it, has a, it certainly has a bearing on possibly limits on what can be done in quantum computing. However, there is normally, you're thinking maybe about spins of electrons or something like that, and, and in which case the actual dis mass displacement is virtually zero. So it's not clear that this quantum criterion I was giving you uh, about you know, Schrodinger's lump, it's not clear that that gives you any limitation that would seriously influence the construction of a quantum computer. I think the limitations of producing a quantum computer are much more different from that, and, and uh, it's very hard to see how one could produce one that really does extensive computations, but maybe the, techni technica the, maybe the technical difficulties will be circumvented at some stage. It's a very interesting idea. I don't think it has, you see, I don't think it has much of a bearing on, on the consciousness issue because it's all within standard quantum mechanics. A quantum computer is supposed to be carrying out operations in accordance with standard quantum mechanics. 
And that, on my scheme, would be perfectly what it would do, provided there is not too much displacement of mass in the operation of the machine. If there is, then, yeah, that's a new thing. Then you could say, well, is this a limitation on what com quantum computers could do, or does it get to something beyond? That's an interesting question, too. See, people used to think with computers, well, we'd be getting down to the quantum limit, and that's going to be something that's going to wreck it. Well, then other people say, no, no, wait. If we know about quantum mechanics, how it behaves, we can use quantum mechanics. So then you can make quantum computers, which, whatever the quantum limit is, we, we don't care about that because we're making use of quantum phenomena. So it might be there's an analog of that. You say, OK, we're getting near the limit of how much mass displacement there can be. Well, if somebody is really clever about how to do this, they might make use of that in some way, which would enable you to build a device which transcends the ordinary notion of a, of a Turing machine. Someone right at the back there. Yes. Thank you for the, for the lovely talk. You mentioned that um, mathematical ability, the ability to do math is not uh, necessarily favorable for natural selection. <laughs> yes. And I take it from that that you mean that awareness is favorable for natural selection. Yes. Now, That's if the claim. <laughs> you, 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 purposefully, you purposefully avoided defining what awareness is, but if we take awareness as something that is conducive for natural selection, then what essentially we're talking about is the ability to model your environment, model yourself as part of the environment, have the ability to select your actions based on projections of how your environment will act, etc. I think that if this is what we mean when we say awareness, then Manuela Veluso's soccer-playing robots are already aware. I agree with everything you said except the last sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she would think they're aware either. Um, but, uh, I mean, yes, I think in my cartoon I was hoping to show if you don't look at the mathematician, you look at the other individuals in the picture, they are doing things for which they're understanding and no doubt awareness. I don't know if I can find that picture right on the spot, but um, there were other individuals in other parts of the picture <laughs> making mammoth traps, um, growing crops, building uh, enclosures for animals, building huts, and all sorts of things which involve imagination, you know, often putting your, you know, maybe putting yourself in the place of a mammoth and think, what would that mammoth do? It might like to walk that way, you see, and it wouldn't see this. I could see that this is a, a trap if I don't put my bushes over in this spot. And, okay, all these things probably do involve awareness, consciousness, and I certainly believe that consciousness has a favorable, uh, is favorable for, for natural selection. I mean, it would be favored in natural selection. It's just that I don't see that the, the football playing dogs, or whatever they were, um, show any evidence of being conscious. Uh, but of course, that's, that's the issue. Hi. Uh, could you give us a specific example of being aware without understanding? Well, you see, I was being very cautious <laughs> and concentrating my attention only on this very tiny restricted area of mathematics in understanding. But not for any reason that I think there's anything special about our use of awareness there. I don't, and I can't, because I'm saying it's natural selection, and it's not natural selection of mathematicians. It's natural selection which favors consciousness. And uh, it's very hard to... to be very precise about these things. I mean, consciousness, uh, in the, uh, the passive aspect of consciousness, which is awareness, if you like, has extraordinarily many manifestations. You know, just the image of something, the color, uh, the sound, pain, um, emotions, all these things are aspects of our awareness. And uh, most of them don't have much to do with appreciating uh, Gödel theorems and things like that. But nevertheless, I think they are not only parts of consciousness, and therefore, according to me, things which are outside the standard conventional physics, uh, things which are explained by conventional physics. But nevertheless, I believe them to be real phenomena, and uh, something which, which 
scientific exploration will, I hope, ultimately shed a good deal more light on. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I believe I followed the proof of Gödel's incompleteness, uh, Gödel, Turing's version of Gödel's incompleteness yeah, okay. theorem, uh, and I, uh, I think that the cautious um, uh, oracle doesn't make it any much more complicated. But uh, is there some other reason why you choose to use exactly this kind of an oracle? Because I, I suppose that there are plenty of different uh, oracles out there, and. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why Turing introduced... I think, well, he was a very inventive person. I think he was more concerned with the ordinal logics because that actually was the title of the paper. It was his... Uh, the, the oracle was sort of an afterthought, I think. But the, uh, the idea that you could build and have more and more powerful systems in ways which are almost systematic because they depend on the same way in which you build up ordinals. But the problem is when you, you get to the more complicated oracles, you have to formalize or systematize the way in which you add the Gödel statements. And this lands you in various problems, such as, for example, how do you know whether two computable ordinals are the same ordinal or not? And that's a problem which, you, which has undecidable aspects to it. So uh, it lands you in trouble. But, uh, but it was a very clever idea. And, Certain people have been uh, making use of the oracle idea in all sorts of other ways. I just thought this was a... I was introducing this idea more or less, almost in a negative sense from my own point of view, because it would be nice to see, okay, this generalization of a computation is perhaps what the new kind of quantum mechanics involves, and maybe we use that in our thinking processes. But this more or less dashes that. It's saying, no, no, it's nothing like that. It's nothing like what people call, I just said it earlier in the talk, what do they call it? Uh, Hypercomputation, that's it. The, when people talk about hypercomputation, they're usually talking about oracles which can um, solve the pi n sentences or something like that and can actually answer yes or no to those sentences. But I'm not saying that's what we do. I'm sure even much simpler mathematical statements might turn out to be beyond us. That's not the point. The point is that by the Gödel procedure, you seem to be able to transcend any given computational procedure which you trust. And, and, you, and you can't use it as a proof of theorems unless you trust it. So you're caught, you see. You, if you trust it, then you can see how to go beyond it. And I, it seems to me that's, uh, that shows that you can't um, ever settle on a precise formal system which encapsulates what we do when we understand mathematics. Understanding involves the uh, working of millions of neurons and the signaling between them. Why do you believe that uh, very, very small effects going on in the microtubules can influence this large computation? So I see a gap in your arguments here from this tiny scale to what's going on in the brain. No, the idea is that the synapse strengths, you see, if the synapses had a definite strength all over the brain, then I would accept, yes, the action of the brain would be a computational, something you could, you could simulate with a general purpose computer, yes. However, these strengths of synapses, it's very curious the way they act, you know, these chemicals going, why don't, why don't they just connect them or something like that? It seems very strange the way the, the brain operates in this way. Um, and the microtubules, well, they go, in, I had a picture of that somewhere back here. They go into the, into the vicinity of the synapses. In the axons, I think they go right down into them. In the dendrites, there are, the information goes in, in, in there's another kind of part of the cytoskeleton um, uh, which, which extends up into the, into the dendrites. But the microtubules are right there. And so the idea is that the microtubules in a much overall, in a sort of overall way, in a coherent, acting in a coherent way over large regions of the brain. I should say that the, if the criterion that I was mentioning uh, for the reduction of the quantum state is the correct thing, 
that wouldn't be involved in individual microtubules. You'd need to have lots and lots of microtubules acting in concert. And that these would then coherently influence the strengths of many, many synapses altogether. So it's not small in the sense that we're just talking about one microtubule. There are a whole lot of them which would have to be involved in a, in a large scale quantum coherent uh, state. And that this thing would, at least for a lot of the time, be acting in accordance with quantum mechanics. But then when the state reduction happens, something else comes in, and then that's what the, would be where consciousness is involved. And one reason for saying things like this, you may say it's all pretty outrageous, but it seems to me consciousness is a completely different phenomenon from anything else we know in the universe. Now, either you're going to say it's something quite different from the rest of the universe, as some people might say. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's something which is out there in the rest of the universe, but it's hardly ever harnessed because these state reductions are almost always random. And so they're not got together in some coherent way. So you need some organization where these state reductions take place in a kind of organized way, an orchestrated way is what, what we say. And so it's a global thing. It's not individual microtubules that are involved. It's a whole quantum state which would be extend over, over large areas of the brain all at once. That would be the idea. You could say that's outrageous, but then the whole consciousness is pretty outrageous, really. So you need, I think you need something outrageous. My question is about a possible link between evolution, mathematics, and a special form of consciousness which many people in AI and cognitive science are interested in, metacognition, namely being aware of aspects of your own thinking. And the connection yeah. is this. It's clear that in the case of human children, uh, there are things they learn empirically and then later discover that there's a way of reorganizing that into a generative theorem. It happens with language and lots, that's obvious. They switch to using a syntax. But I suspect, and Anne Kamalov Smith, a developmental psychologist in London, also mm. came from a very different re, uh, direction to the conclusion that that happens in a number of animals. And um, it might be exactly the sort of thing that an organism needs in order to get beyond having to try everything out. You, you learn lots of things and you get a way of re organizing your knowledge so you can work things out what must happen. Mm -hmm. And that, I suspect, it, and you probably might agree, is the origin of the discovery of Euclidean geometry, for instance, which mm -hmm. later got systematized. But yeah. initially, there weren't teachers to teach the kids geometry as there are now, so it must have come out of something in evolution. No. So if yeah. all of that is correct, could that be connected with the kind of thing that you're talking about, that transformation of knowledge, from lots of empirically gained patterns to something that's got much more power because it can be applied to situations that are novel, which is exactly what mathematics is all about. And perhaps you have offered an implementation of what evolution did. I don't know about that. No, I'm completely sympathetic with what you're saying. I think that you've put it very well. I do agree it is something like, I mean, certainly in the, in the girdle Turing argument, you're standing back and thinking about what you I mean, it's, it's very much the same thing. And that kind of thing could obviously, I mean, it's, it's the sort of thing that could really have a selective advantage. You sort of stand back, what has the society been doing, you know? And you might think, you, also things like putting your place in the, in the in, you know, so empathy, that kind of idea where you, you think a bit more globally. You're not just thinking about yourself, you're thinking about other people, or you, it may be your enemies, it may be the saber tooth tiger you're thinking about, what, what would it do, you see? And these things are probably all part of that standing back and thinking a bit on a broader way about what you were thinking about in a more kind of focused way before. And that is certainly the kind of thing that's going on. I agree with that, yes. Okay, folks, we're going to take two final questions. One from the back there. Um, if, for the sake of argument, the fundamental laws of physics are computable, then wouldn't the operation of the brain be computable simply by virtue of being a physical object? And doesn't that make the argument about um, what was selected for by natural selection irrelevant in a sense, because regardless of what's selected for, it's, it would still be computable? Um, 
Again, I'm agreeing with everything you say, I think, except for the last. <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's part of the argument, what you're saying. Sure. I mean, I say that if, if the ingredients are computable, then so is the whole thing. I mean, it's like a computer. You just need to know that the, the individual um, transistors or whatever it is are doing what they're supposed to in a, in a way which is computably understandable. And then the whole thing, yeah. If the ingredients are, then so is the whole thing. Um, so, yeah, that's part of the argument, and that's why I think there has to be something in the ingredients which are not computable. That's, that's, that's the, if you like, the point of perhaps disagreement at the end, but I'm agreeing with what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, the last question over there. Roger, thank you for the uh, excellent talk. Um, my understanding of, the, uh, of your theory about the microtubules is that that plays a key role in um, how consciousness works. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how that plays into free will, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, quantum theory uh, is uh, a linear thing, but it, with randomness. So where do, where, when I decide to uh, go out for a pizza, where does that come from? You may not realize it, but I'm a terribly conservative person. And when it comes to questions of free will, I, I backtrack. I think there is an important question and an issue there. Uh, I hesitate to try and pronounce on it. I think that, I mean, I rather agree with Martin Gardner when he commented on this to me at once, that, that it's a very deep question. And it's not a trivial one that you can somehow dismiss, uh, you know, either we're deterministic or not or something. That there is an issue there. And, uh, there are these experiments which in some respects seem to indicate that if you're trying to make a decision then you'd already made that decision before you thought you'd make that decision and things like that. I think they're all a bit questionable about what they really show. I certainly regard free will as the active aspect of consciousness, whatever that is. But I don't really have anything useful to say about it. I think I would just say that it is a problem I think there is such a thing as free will. I'm not sure how to, how to, how to describe it or to, uh, how to see how it fits in with anything, whether it even means non-determinism or what. I mean, often you could say lack of determinism could simply be probabilistic behavior, and that's not really free will. So uh, what is it? I don't know. It's part of the story. I, I agree with that. Roger, thank you very much. I know there are people who want to ask questions, but I think we must call this to a close at this point. So I want to thank Roger on your behalf for this wonderful talk. By the way, you'll have seen that he's, a, he's famous for the way he handles his overheads. <laughs> um, he is an artist. He drew, um, for instance, that picture of the jungle out there. Um, and it was a great privilege to hear this depth of thought about so many topics. I have one question for you. Did you ever meet Turing during your life? Did you, no, did you have? No, it's one of my great regrets. I knew, I knew various people who knew him well. Well, Max Newman, who, who, yeah. uh, who knew him well, and, and Christopher Strachey, who knew him well. Uh, various people, and they all had stories about him, but I never met him, okay. sadly. I never well, met Einstein, and I never yeah. met Turing. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the greatest privileges would have been to hear Turing and Roger Penrose discussing with each other. <laughs> what I do think we had proven for us tonight is that Roger Penrose's mind is not computable. <laughs> Please, can you thank him?